In recent years, I've been to a few concerts and events where I've flown into town for a three or four day weekend, done other activities during the day, and then attended the show at night, making for really memorable trips. It's something that I'd like to do in the future for more concerts, plays, and sporting events. This trip was longer, at seven nights, as if I'm taking an eight hour flight anywhere, I'm spending at least a week. So I figured the fight was on Saturday. I'd attend some of the lead up events and spend the rest of the time exploring London. And for the most part, things went according to plan. I was already excited as it got closer to the time for Anthony Joshua versus Jermaine Franklin as I'd been watching the lead up to the fight. I got up early on the day of to purchase tickets and made arrangements for my airfare and hotel that weekend. I also began researching places to visit, things to do, and like just overall how to have a good experience in London. So I'd been just like excitedly counting down the time until my trip. Going back to my childhood, I'd watched many boxing matches, but this was going to be my first time attending a fight in person. I arrived in London, attended some of the lead up events, which just built the anticipation. A cool thing about attending an in-person fight, as someone who's rekindled my interest, let's say, in boxing within recent years, is that I've come to know or be aware of some of the journalists from like watching interviews, and also, you know, through that, I've become aware of some of the other fighters. Attending the lead-up events is pretty cool because you get to see some of these people, if not meet and speak to them in person. And a lot of this stuff takes place in London, whereas I live here in America. I arrived in town on the day of the press conference, and while I didn't have press credentials, I stopped by on my way to go sightseeing out of curiosity, just to see if I'd be able to spot anyone. I didn't plan to, but ended up chatting with a few people and getting some pics. I had the opportunity to spend a few minutes speaking with Derek James, and was surprised by how down-to-earth and normal he was. That conversation turned out to be one of the highlights of the trip. The day before the fight, I went to the weigh-in and had some really cool conversations with other people who were like in the crowd. The weigh-in was cool, but afterwards I had a chance to see Anthony Joshua a bit more up close. He is a big guy. But then I got a chance to meet and take pics with people I'd seen over the years on YouTube, like some of his friends and um, interviewers, things like that, journalists. And so it's like the experience presented an opportunity to get more pics from my scrapbook. Boxing is a very brutal sport, but many of the people involved, whether directly or indirectly, very normal, if not nice folks that you wouldn't mind chatting with. Anthony Joshua has gotten a lot of flack for being perceived by some as being fake, because he can be brutal in the ring, but friendly and respectful at other times. But it seems to be much the same with many of the other people involved with boxing. People have different personalities, and you're certainly not obligated to take time out of your day for pictures. So I'm sure with other people or under different circumstances, the experiences might not have been so thoroughly positive, but I'm glad that they were. I was really surprised by how tall so many of these guys are. I'd seen Eddie Hearn, Derek James, Tony Bellew, Coogan from IFL TV, Derek Chisora, and others on YouTube or in pictures. I'd seen Dylan White and Jermaine Franklin stand across from Anthony Joshua in face-off pictures. I never thought any of these guys were short, but more like average height. But when you see them in person, they're all at least a few inches over six feet. What I realized is that I'd seen many of them standing next to someone like Anthony Joshua Tyson Fury, men who are extremely tall and for lack of a better term, bulky, thus making them look relatively smaller in comparison. The day of the fight arrived and I spent the early part of the day visiting Brixton and sightseeing elsewhere in the city. Um, I returned to my hotel, took another shower, got dressed, and then headed to the train station. It was easy enough to get around using public transportation as they have a really good transit system. I took the tube from my hotel out in Shepherd's Bush to the O2 Arena and it was about maybe like a 40 minute train ride. Really straightforward, easy. Use Google Maps. I used that to get around everywhere. We got off at the Peninsula Square station stop which is like maybe just like a five minute um, walk to the venue with some other venues there's really just like the event area where you might have you know maybe several stages um, food court something like that but the O2 is a little bit different from like standalone venues or at least the ones I've been to here in America in the sense that it's 
an entertainment complex. So sure, there's the O2 Arena, but it's within a larger complex where there's a movie theater, attractions, several bars, restaurants. You could spend a good day at the O2 between attending a show or event in the evening and going to the movie, shopping, getting dinner and whatnot during the day. You know, and it's not really that far outside of town. It's a cool option if you're visiting, um, especially for someone who's like visiting from out of town or from even outside of the country. I like to watch the undercard fights, but going sightseeing early in the day resulted in me leaving my hotel for the O2 later than anticipated. I arrived during the second or maybe third round of the Austin Ammo Williams versus River Wilson bent fight. It was cool to walk into the lion's den. There's like this blue glow. You walk into this open area where there's a spotlight on the ring in which two guys are boxing. Williams had made a lot of noise in the lead up to the fight, and it was a bit surreal to now be there and see him deliver and all that talk, leading to Wilson Ben's corner throwing in the towel in the eighth round. It was like a good start to the night. I don't know what it's like for a concert at the O2, but for a boxing match, I purchased what I thought would be really great seats as they were on the floor behind the ringside seats. Ringside is cordoned off, the reason being that like the fighters walk through that area. And in addition to that, this is typically where like celebrities, the ringside announcers, judges, other VIPs, they're in that area. And typically VIP areas are roped off. Once I found out the fight was going to be at the O2, I tried to find like a boxing match seating chart to get an idea of the best seat, but couldn't find anything relevant. I was worried that I might not be able to get tickets given past sales activity. So like on the morning of, I just went ahead and purchased what they said were the best available tickets, you know, below the ringside tier. I like Anthony Joshua, but I don't like Anthony Joshua enough to pay for ringside seats at this point in my life. I figured, you know, it's my first time in a boxing match. It might be my only time and I'm flying in for the fight. So let me have the best experience I can within a budget, obviously. Initially, I was the only person going and I found a floor seat. When you go to a concert or play, typically the closer you can get to the stage, the better. But I learned that floor seats without some kind of rise or slope at a boxing match are a hustle. I was in the section behind the ringside seats and the view was often terrible. A boxing match is going to take place in a boxing ring. A boxing ring is elevated off the ground by maybe three, five feet. At a concert, the stage is elevated, but there's nothing really blocking your view. With a boxing match, the ropes are in the way. When short to average height boxers are in the ring, a good portion of their body, if not the majority, is blocked by the ropes. You end up watching a lot of the match on the screen above the ring because you can see the action more clearly. A lot of people were still filtering in during the last undercard fights, so you constantly had people walking by, which further blocks your view. Once the venue really started to fill up and the seats in front of you are now full, when people do something as simple as like moving their head or shifting in their seat, they might block your view. There are pros and cons to watching at home, but it's a pretty cool experience when you're at home watching. You kind of have the best seat in the house because the TV cameras give the best shots and angles possible and the ropes typically aren't in the way. You can kick your feet up if you need to go to the bathroom. There's no line. You don't have to take like a five minute, maybe like 10 minute round trip walk to go to the bathroom. You want a snack, you get up, you go grab something. It's like you're comfortable. But being there in the venue, the energy of watching with thousands of other people, it's like it's its own benefit. After the first fight, I looked over my shoulder and noticed a large screen behind the stage where like Tony Bellew, Dylan White, and Laura Woods were recording what I'm guessing was commentary for the zone. Honestly, the way they spell their name is ridiculous because when I first watched the fight on the app a few years ago, I thought it was pronounced Dazen. It took hearing people mention the zone multiple times to realize that's how the, like, the name is supposed to be pronounced. And the name itself sounds really generic anyway. It was then that I realized that when you're in the venue, there's no announcer. There's no ongoing commentary or live analysis. You'd be surprised how much of a difference that makes, how much that like commentary adds to the excitement of the fight when you're watching at home. Until the venue fills up and even then, it's unexpectedly quiet, especially while a fight is taking place. In the breaks between fights, there's people talking, moving around, there's music playing, but given the size of the space, it ends up becoming like white noise, where it's like a hum in the background. You get like used to it pretty quickly, and I found myself unconsciously tuning it out. Like it didn't bother me, but 
I just didn't notice it after a while. I expected it to be like super loud, but I guess not at a boxing event. And I will say shout out to Tony and Dylan for the outfits because they were different from each other. But I think both of them, like they looked really nice. Tony Bellamy had on like a really nice dark pinstripe suit. Picture perfect look for a ringside analyst. And then you had Dylan White in like this army green type outfit that was nicely color coordinated to match his sneakers. Honorable mention as I'd vote Franklin as having best hair as his locks were freshly twisted and really nicely styled when he showed up for the weigh-in. Now, most boxing fans probably don't care but I look at outfits too. It's not something that most interviewers ask questions about but you can tell the boxers and many of the other guys do put care into like their appearance especially for fight night. For the fight week events quite often the boxers and their team's outfits match. That tends to continue into the kit for fight night. I noted and compared the boxers fight kits as far as like the style of their trunks and boots. Anthony Joshua tends to get a fresh haircut for his fights. David Diamante is instantly recognizable with his long locks and nicely tailored suits. It reminds me of how Lennox Lewis used to come to like fights with these fresh locks put up. Mike Tyson often had a fade or some other low cut with the sharp part and those simple but iconic black trunks and boots with the fire red gloves while Muhammad Ali wore pristine white trunks. No shade to the undercard fighters, but from what I saw of them, Pretty much all of the undercard fights seemed a bit uneven. Often the action came from only one of the fighters and the fight ended early with stoppages. They do a ring walk, enter the ring, and then a few minutes later the fight would be over. There were lulls between fights where like they tried to kind of keep the crowd entertained by having like the shadow boxing cam, shooting t-shirts out into the crowd, and all that was cool, but the constant stopping and starting with the fights killed some of the momentum. It was noticeable because I seem to remember especially enjoying all of the undercard fights for the second Joshua vs. Usyk fight. Because the undercard fights ended early, the main event started a bit earlier than planned, which was fine. I made my way to the stage behind the seats so I could get some pics as Franklin and Joshua emerged for their ring walks. The O2 isn't super large, so the distance from like stage to ring isn't that far. The fighter's name is announced, music plays, and they walk out on the stage and maybe pose, shadow box for a little bit before entering the ring. Franklin came out to some rap music and posed a bit before entering the ring. The only thing that I didn't like was that the crowd booed him, which I thought was rude and unnecessary. Anthony Joshua can't get in the ring and fight by himself, so regardless of him being your guy, you should still show his competitor some respect. All that extra business is unnecessary. I hate it when boxers are extra for no reason during the press conference and lead up events, so I'm not at all here for it when the crowd is being messy. I still clapped and cheered for Franklin because AJ would be shadow boxing without him. It's boxing, a sport, which is simply a professional game. I hope for an exciting match, but I'm never wishing ill on the other guy. You know, may the best person win on the night and both fighters emerge without any notable or like serious injuries. But putting that aside, my guy's now getting ready to come out, which means the fight and the moment I've been waiting for is finally here. For the main event fighters, the cameras go backstage and follow them from their dressing room all the way out, which kind of helps to add to the suspense. At points earlier in the night, they showed clips of both boxers arriving at the venue. They showed a few clips of Franklin getting a massage and otherwise warming up. And they did much of the same, showing the big man is in the building and like when AJ appeared on screen, the venue went crazy. The undercard ring walks were really short, but I know in the past it tended to be a rather long, and I do mean long, production for AJ. The ring walk for that first Usyk fight was ridiculous, and I'm glad that they've scaled it back. I felt they hit just the right amount of time for this ring walk. Exciting, but short and sweet. The camera went backstage to meet him at his dressing room and a rapper guy appeared on stage where like he performed a bit. I don't mean any disrespect, but I haven't followed any kind of rap music in several years. I didn't take into consideration that Anthony Joshua tends to have pyrotechnics as a part of his ring walk. At previous fights, he had like a rising platform with the letters A and J on fire with flames shooting up. Let me tell you, when you're standing near the stage and those flames go off, it is hot as hell. But when he emerged on stage, it's like a dramatic moment. The crowd goes wild. As he made his way to the ring, myself and others made our way back to our seats. And everyone stood up until they touched gloves and the fight began. A very tense moment, but exciting. 
In the time since, the fight itself has gotten some flack for being underwhelming. And to some degree, some of those criticisms are valid. Because sitting and watching the fight, number one, I was surprised by how quickly it seemed to go by. It felt like there was all of this lead up and then you sit there and it's like in no time the fight, like it went the full 12 rounds, but it felt like it was over really quickly. It wasn't an explosive or action-packed fight as some previous Anthony Joshua fights or just some other heavyweight fights in general. There were a few instances of exciting exchanges, but overall, I agree with the assessment that Joshua fought a very cautious fight. On a logical level, I understood this because it wasn't just wanting to win, but arguably even more important for him to not lose, given two back-to-back -back losses against Usyk. Prior to, his last win was in 2020, and before that, it was an arguably cautious win where he avenged himself after a tremendous upset at the hands of Andy Ruiz. Another loss at this point would have been a big problem, if not putting an end to the career of AJ the boxing superstar, and that's regarding regardless of whether or not he was still interested in boxing. Unfortunately, we're in a different era where the public and media are very quick to lose interest and write off boxers who take losses. And this is despite many of the greats who are now heralded Muhammad Ali, Lennox Lewis, George Foreman, Mike Tyson, etc. having lost fights. But attention spans are shorter, news cycles are quicker, and most importantly, while Floyd Mayweather is an incredible boxer who has made contributions to the sport, his record of no losses has also set unrealistic expectations and done possibly irreparable damage to the sport. The reality is that for most boxers, regardless of how good they might be, if you have a career of reasonable length and face good opponents, it is very likely that you will eventually meet someone who just has your number. As long as you put up a good fight and have a solid overall record, there should be no shame in taking a loss. Joshua vs. Franklin was a solid fight, and while he might not have had a big name, I don't think Franklin was given the level of respect he deserved by the public. A man who has the discipline to get up and train day after day to face someone else in the boxing ring deserves his props. Joshua didn't do all that he could have or arguably should have in the ring, but Franklin also wasn't a pushover. I was a little bit disappointed in the fight itself, not because there wasn't a knockout, but rather because of the constant hugging and holding from both boxers throughout the fight. It's a boxing match, not wrestling. Early on in the fight, I was impressed by Franklin not backing down from AJ, but rather answering his attacks with counter punches. It helped to make the early rounds a bit interesting. I don't know if it was frustration, but Franklin started holding a lot more in the later rounds and at some point seemed to be charging Joshua. AJ as well would land a really nice hit, but then that would be it. No real follow-up and certainly very few combinations. Those factors really killed the momentum of the fight and made it rather anticlimactic. Around round four, I found myself sitting there and thinking, is it just me or is this fight okay but not particularly exciting? Yet overall, I had a very positive experience, a great experience actually, and would definitely go to another match. Leading up to the fight, I like the way that both boxers handled themselves. I'm finding that I prefer the fighters that don't do a lot of cursing and carrying on during the press conference and whatnot, but rather just normal, straightforward in the lead up and do their talking in the ring. Given the dust up and controversy with the Dylan White fight last November, and now having received more attention from this AJ fight, I'm curious to see where Franklin goes from here. As Franklin only became a full-time boxer within the last year, it will be interesting to see how he develops from here, being fully focused on boxing. I'm actually quite proud of him and hope he goes on to do great things. Obviously, I'm still following Anthony Joshua's career and keeping an eye on the scuttlebutt about potential upcoming fights. Nothing against Dylan White, but I just really hate the idea of them fighting again. They fought before, it was a clear and decisive win, and given that it takes forever for these fights to get made and actually happen, I just feel like if it happens, it will take so much time before Joshua moves on to fight someone new and interesting. I agree, he needs another fight or two training with Derek James before facing Wilder of Fury, but it just pushes the timeline further down the road, increasing the likelihood that those truly exciting fights might never happen, or that by the time they do occur, the fighters will be past their primes. I liked the much improved way Joshua boxed in the second Usyk fight and thought he could and should have gotten Usyk out of there in the ninth round. 
but you lack the stamina to get the job done, which allowed Yusuf to recover and dominate the remaining rounds. Joshua looked mostly comfortable throughout the Franklin fight, but apprehensive to let his hands go, likely out of fear of not being able to ride with punches that came back his way, or throw in a combination that drained his energy while failing to knock out Franklin, leaving himself in danger. Joshua came in heavier, but his conditioning looked better, though that might be in part because he wasn't throwing a lot of punches. I see the merit in not going back to being a recklessly aggressive fighter, but I think working with Derek James to combine some of that offensive aggression with tighter defense, higher boxing acumen, and just more experience can only help AJ become a more well-rounded boxer. With more time to work together and have everything gel, there could be some very exciting fights in the future. Unfortunately, it was recently announced on AJ's IG account, plans to fight during the summer have been scrapped and he'll be returning in December. On the one hand, that's cool because hopefully it ends any talks of him fighting Dylan White again. Rumor has it that there's now supposed to be a mega tournament of sorts in Saudi Arabia during December with AJ, Fury, Usyk, and Wilder. Maybe unicorns exist and it will happen. Exciting stuff if it truly comes to pass. But these long gaps between fights really don't help AJ, especially when trying to lock things in with a new coach. I hanged around for a bit after the fight and stood near the area where the fighters were exiting to like the backstage area, hoping to snap a picture of him, but he went to the other side of the arena. By the time I got to that area, there was a crowd and security stopped people from moving between the sections. I got fairly close to him, but didn't manage to get like a good picture. But my mom somehow ended up in just the right spot and he helped her take a selfie with him, which made the experience all the more memorable for her, which was really cool. After we exited, some of his friends and family members were very nice about taking pictures as well so I've got like a few more like nice pictures um, quite a collection for my scrapbook the timing of my trip was influenced by AJ's fight but I'd been hoping to visit London for a while everything didn't go according to plan but I'm really glad that I took the chance and had the experience aside from the fight I had quite a few other positive experiences in London and look forward to sharing them I see traveling for another fight, especially if it's in London during the holiday season or some other interesting location. Thanks for tuning in. To ensure you don't miss any episodes, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell. Go ahead and click the thumbs up button if you like what you saw and go ahead and share it on social media.